All right, everybody, don't drop that fast forward button. The sponsorship roll call is about to begin. Energy Consulting Limited provides complete project management and general contracting services to a variety of private sector clients on both commercial and residential construction projects. They act as the owner's representatives through the planning, design, budgeting, scheduling, construction, and occupancy processes. Clients appreciate their open, honest, and flexible approach to achieving their project goals. Although they're located in Surrey, BC, Energy works on projects all over the province, including the growing cities of the north and the beautiful coastal towns of Vancouver Island. They're always excited to explore new places and develop relationships with professionals wherever their clients' interests may be. Abacus North is a firm that specializes in mortgage banking solutions for complex projects. In addition to providing financing solutions in a traditional mortgage broker capacity, Abacus North provides direct loans that range from $2 million to $25 million. On a syndicated basis, they provide mortgage banking solutions up to $300 million. In most cases, their in-house capital solutions can bridge financing gaps that traditional lenders are unable to service. They specialize in providing land acquisition loans, construction financing for large-scale developments, income-producing properties, and single-purpose facilities. With a portfolio that includes high-rise, mid-rise, and low-rise condominiums, townhouse developments, shopping centers, agricultural properties, industrial developments, and medical marijuana facilities, Abacus North is at the forefront of creative mortgage banking solutions with a focus on fostering long-term relationships. They are a multifaceted organization that services domestic and international clients with their mortgage banking needs. Complex financing solutions require analytical thinking well beyond a typical mortgage broker relationship. As a result, they focus on providing engineered solutions for their client. Their key differentiation strategy is that they assist clients in actively managing the capital stack in order to minimize borrowing costs while maximizing flexibility. Abacus North focuses on national and global opportunities. Ascentia CPA has a team of new-gen chartered professional accountants that are dedicated to advancing companies using expertise combined with emerging technologies. The team at Ascentia will implement the latest accounting technologies, allowing you to not only run a business, but to run a smart business that will excel in your industry. Their focus is to provide growth-centric, value-added, and timely accounting services for businesses as well as individuals across Canada. Unlike standard accounting firms, by embracing cloud-based software, the team at Ascentia will provide you with real-time accounting information on a secure platform that is accessible anywhere at any time, allowing you to make better informed decisions and gain more controlled overview of your financial data. The reliability and expertise you'll experience with the professionals at Ascentia will assist you in the preparation of corporate and personal tax returns, financial statements, bookkeeping, government filings, tax and estate planning, as well as business advisory services. For more information on the advantages of online accounting and to book a complimentary meeting online, be sure to visit ascentiacpa.ca. We are... I. All right, we're recording. This is okay. it. So we don't necessarily have to wear the. The headphones, but if you uh, if we want to throw them on, we can. I'll just Does it make here. us feel cooler? It makes us look cooler. I know that one time somebody told me they're just like you have them on the wrong way, so that was uh, that yeah. was. Do I have button. them on the wrong way? I know there's like a little like R and an L. Oh yeah, no, I know how to write right. Sweet. All right, so we are kind of just talking about how this uh, this gentleman's podcast series is too about like. 90 degree furniture and <laughs> rewilding and kind of that whole um, experience. And you also said you just got back from uh, having a walk in the snow. Yes. So um, where are you at that process and like what made you kind of like get into it, get started? Like I want to rewild or I want to be more connected back to nature. Or I want to make these transitions or I'm willing to listen to a podcast about it or anything along those lines. I mean, I don't think I'm necessarily in the process of rewilding in like a big way, like we're not getting rid of our furniture. But uh, last year, I'm I'm a yoga teacher and I took um, a yoga teacher training for prenatal yoga and baby me yoga. 
And the teacher was all about the concept of rewilding and just being out in nature. And I think it last year was about anything for me. It was about being outside. Like it was my goal to have like an outside adventure at least once a week. What were some of the adventures that you went on? Um, it's just a lot of running and a lot of hiking. My favorite one would have been Fat Dog 120. My friend um, ran the whole 120 miles. I think it was like 125 miles actually. Um, and I got to pace him for a section through the night. So we were like running and hiking through the middle of the night with like headlamps on That's and just awesome. like howling at the moon and just making funny sound effects and yeah. whatever. But just out of like being outside. You know, and I find like those kind of, those experiences, like when you're out in the middle of nowhere at night and even like, cause like we do a lot of stuff with like no headlamps, you know, because you can see like a lot of people think when you're like in the back country in the middle of the night that you just, you can't see because it's too dark, but it's actually quite the opposite. It's a lot. It, it was pretty think. dark though at times. <laughs> yeah. But you just like, it feels, well, I feel it. I shouldn't generalize it to everybody. Like I always feel like it just feels right. Where it just kind of feels like this is the way that it should be, you know, and when you click like the headlamps on and then you see like the gear and like the little reflectors on our shoes and all like everything just kind of looks a little bit foreign because when you look around, there's nothing that resembles that. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't have the experience of running without it on, so I can't really like we did turn it off so we could look at the, you know, just look at all the stars and have that experience of like nothing. But I haven't run like that, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try it now, though. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Like, and, and I say, like, you know, like, running, like, I do night run, but, like, we're, like, kind of more, even if you're just still, you just, like, you're kind of, like, hanging out, you're not doing anything, like, what you guys did, just looking up at the stars. Like, there's all this representation of, like, like, tranquility and nothing that's intrusive, you know? Like, even there's all these big, massive trees, like, swaying in the wind, yeah. or you're in these mountains, or anything along these lines, but... It all seems like it cohabitates visually in your space in a very tranquil way. You know, but then you throw in like these super bright headlamps and like these, you know, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Where it's like that, it just doesn't seem like it belongs. No, that makes sense. For yeah. Sure. But uh, let's reel it back. I want to know like who you are from the beginning, you know, because like uh, we <laughs> talked about before when we first met, there's this common denominator I find between like everybody who's into kind of like, you know, Eastern modalities. You know, like yoga, you know, like TCM, you know, like, you know, Ayurveda, like anything along these lines that they have a real artsy or like dance, you know, like they're really right brain. So um, bring us back. Like you were born and then. Oh, I was born. Okay. Well, I was born in Romania, in Transylvania. And um, I don't know. We didn't stay there very long. We escaped. It was communist. Um, we moved to West Germany and we lived in Cologne, Cologne. And that's the first time we had TV. And I was like, as soon as we had TV, I was like, I want to be inside of the TV. So. Well, then I got, before we go there, I need to know what it was like growing up in a communist country. Like, how old were you when, when you guys left? Like, did you have a full awareness of what was going on? I think my awareness grew after we left, once I had something to compare it to. I was about five and a half when we left. My dad left when I was three. And, um, I mean, I knew he was leaving and I knew he wasn't going to be coming back. And after that point, like, I know our letters were opened and a house was wired and like, there were certainly things happening, but I was a kid. I don't know if I knew, but we moved to Germany during Carnival, which is just like this crazy like festival. So I went from a place where we stood in line for bread and had coupons and would change things with our neighbors Mm -hmm to a place where people were like dressing up and throwing candy at me, right? So it was just like... So strange. Yeah, so it was. And all of a sudden we had like kiwis and avocados and oranges and like just things that aren't available in a communist country where there's no import-export. So it was just like a crazy amount of abundance, I guess, that it was like, oh, is this all necessary? Um So kind of like looking at like, obviously there's a lot with like a a communist way of life that we don't really agree with or like, you know, that we wouldn't want to live necessarily by that code. But like there is this side that we like over consume, we live in abundance. Like these are just things that like, you know, we we shouldn't have like in our lives. And 
you know, like, again, it comes back to having a kiwi every single day of the year. Like, we, we just really don't need that. Like, do you see, like, those being some kind of, like, the advantages? Because, like, I don't even know, like, what food would be available if you went to stand in line for bread or you have, like, these coupons. Like, like, is there three items on the shelves? Like, what is that experience? Like, and would you say that that would almost be better, you know, for us having less options like that? I mean, I wouldn't want to go back to that country with that level of fear during Ceausescu because that was obviously scary. But yeah, I think less options are good. Like I see photographs of myself as a kid and I have like three toys. You know, I had like that ball and that monkey and whatever. Like I had like three things maybe. And then we moved to Germany and people are giving me a bag full of things because we're these new immigrants and they're giving us stuff, which is lovely. But I can't tell you what those things are, right? Yeah. Because when you have so much, you don't like treasure it and value it. And I'm certainly an experienced person. I really value experiences over things. And do you think that's because of the way that you grew up? Like when we don't have things, we have to rely on other stuff to be able to, you know, kind of like help make us happy and, you know, like give us, you know, like connect us in different ways, you know, but like we resort back now to always having, um, you know, like toys or, you know, like things that just aren't like experience related to things that actually connect us? I don't know if that has to do with communism. For me, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, which is a very strict religion. Yeah. And we weren't really allowed to accessorize with things. Like I didn't mm. get my ears pierced. I was like maybe 23 or 24. Like, yeah, we just... I mean, I'm going to get a little yeah, feedback like a from buzz. these things. I'm going to try and plug. It's yeah. it's, is it the head? I just think there's sometimes we get like a little bit of disturbance on these, okay. but we can, we can get rid of unplug them. those and pop yeah. those off and it can just be you and I. I'm good with that. Okay. We don't get to look fancy. Yeah, <laughs> we're not cool anymore. That's okay. Yeah, so I was saying that I don't know if that's because of communism, but for me, I know growing up Seventh day Adventist, there was a lot of things that I had to say no to. Uh, and that was just kind of ingrained in the way I grew up. And my family was like that. So I think. And you get in like um, that, that culture is notorious for living long lives, right? Like, yeah, yeah like in like to like the hundreds and like, yeah. you know, like in like healthy because of like the. My grandma was stuff. 92 the first time she was like ill. Yeah. Right? Like, and then, I mean, she did die shortly after that sort mm-hmm. of. But she lived by herself. She had an apartment in the city. And my, isn't that what we would all want, though? Is totally. Like, 92, get sick once, and then pass away shortly thereafter. Like, I, I would like to, in, versus, like, a, a Western culture way, like, from, you know, probably 55, 60 plus, and yeah. then, like, you know, 20, 30 years of pill popping and doctor's visits. And vegetarianism is, like, a really big part of that religion. Not everybody, but a lot of them, and certainly my grandma was, and so I grew up vegetarian, and so... Mm-hmm. Also, again, and limiting and not always having everything. I think it's just like part of the way yeah. that I've always looked at things. So when you guys got to Germany, was there like a huge pendulum swing for you? Was it like like all this gluttony was around you and people were offering this like kind of like gluttonous lifestyle mm-hmm. to you? That, like was it hard to deal with, especially at such a young age too, right? Like five and a half, you said? Yeah, I don't Ooh. know if. If I interpret it that way, I think I was very happy to have left because it was just safer. Yeah. Like we were ex, like we left a house and people with guns came and they took us to like the the train station. So it wasn't like oh. like it was intense. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, I lived in this like really safe place, and there wasn't like the fear of um, like war or like certain things that were just like always kind of on our mind. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was we were living in a country where there weren't a lot of immigrants at the time. I think Germany now is super immigrant friendly, but like yeah, at that time, like it was like 1987, I guess we moved to Germany. Like before the wall fell, like there just weren't a lot of people who were oh, German. Yeah, right. So there was that. Like we lived in a neighborhood and everybody owned a house and. We were, like, renting an attic and, like, people, I don't know. So all of my friends just had a lot more stuff, and I was Mm -hmm. aware that we had less. And I think I wanted more. Like, I don't think it was like, oh, these people are gluttonous. I was like, oh, I want that too. Yeah. 
which is, yeah, is a part of that. And it kind of sets those seeds in us of like saying, okay, well, I want that too. You know, like this is the next thing because that's, you know, essentially the culture that we live in today where we just happen to see things and then we have to know somebody that might have that or a version of that. So it's kind of all those little seeds that make us like overconsume, overeaten, you know, like you see that like when you went and it's something that I struggle with now and I really try to pull it all back. Like, you know, and it's funny because like obviously now it's called living like a minimalist lifestyle. You know, we have to coin a term for it and all that kind of stuff versus just kind of getting back into a way of life that we should be living. Um, but it's hard. Yeah, and I think I would live a much more minimalist lifestyle, but like my partner likes stuff. Like yeah. if you look around, like there's a lot of stuff. Like yeah. when we walked in, we saw those shoes. Like before I moved in, the shoes were up there. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. so, it's just like finding a balance between mm-hmm. between it, and it's not all. It doesn't have to be all one way or another. Yeah, and that's where like I find like what I try to focus on and reel it back to is kind of something you alluded to at the beginning is is collecting memories, collecting you know like ideals, collecting conversations, and you know like relationships and people because I feel like if I'm gonna I look at the things, you know, like, like as the times when I have moved, like, you know, like geographically, like in my life, or when you kind of look around at the stuff, like, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. But when you see somebody that, like, you haven't seen for a while, or, like, you have a great conversation with them, like, you'll always remember that. Like, there's a lot attached to that. Like, you know, like, it's this conversation, and, like, all the conversations I've had on this podcast, where, like, I look back on where I sit and think I can remember great things about them. But I look back at, like, thinking about some of the things in my house, and I'm like, well, what is in there again? Like, you have to like reel your way through it. And like, I want to disconnect from that and get back into more of these like interpersonal relationships and, you know, memories to be able to share with people and experiences. So how long were you guys in Germany for? Um, we were there till 1994. So I was 13 when we moved. Okay. And then where'd you guys go from there? We, we came right here in Vancouver, Canada. Um, and I thought, cause I don't know, I, I was really excited about it. Like I was, 13 so it's like sad to leave like my best friend and I didn't really speak English and there were certainly things that made me scared or sad about coming here but my idea of what this was going to be like was from TV it was like 90210 I thought going to high school was going to be like that (laughs) and it wasn't so I think I came with a lot of like hope because even at 13 I think the idea of like reinventing yourself and starting over can be very present and as somebody who was a dancer and who wanted to be an actor like moving here made so much sense like it was it was exciting because there was like Jason Priestley and Michael J. Fox like those those stars at the time who were from here which made that dream seem more possible whereas in Germany I was just like you know that immigrant kid right so it wasn't as possible yeah and like what were you doing like from like say six to 13 like what was your life like there like you said like you were dancing but like what what led you in even to seeing like kind of this um this hollywood lifestyle here like was it something that you know because now you had access to tv when you were in germany and like you started dancing like it was all the formulation of all those experiences i think my parents wanted me to have like what all the other kids had so i got to take horseback riding classes and i took ballet and i just like did all those kind of yeah. privileged things and I remember being super terrified of dancing like I remember the first time we had to perform like I think my nose started bleeding like profusely yeah. from yeah. fear because I was quite shy and um, the dance teacher just put some cotton balls up my nose and shoved me out and that was that and that rush of performing just kind of clicked in Yeah. and I don't know I just I would, I would watch these movies. Um, there was this one specific German movie, Anna Ballerina, and she was this dancer who like, was in New York. And all of a sudden, I started seeing these images. And images are really powerful. And when life isn't super awesome, I think you just spend a lot of time daydreaming. So I just started daydreaming. And these images that I was seeing were, you know, kind of creating that canvas. Yeah. So, like, when, when you guys came over here, what was it like when you first landed? Like, you know, coming into, like, Vancouver, is it just like, okay, you know, 13-year-old self, like, we got to... Yeah, I came a month before my parents came, because my sister was already living here, and she's 13 years older than me, so I stayed with them. And 
it was not super awesome. It was really, really hard. Like, I remember I went to Burnaby South, and that first day I saw a fight, and some guy sliced another guy, like, ear. Like, it was just, like, yeah. terrifying. And my English wasn't, like, great. I understood a lot just from having listened to popular music. Um, but I couldn't communicate, and I came... Just even the way I looked, like in Germany, all the girls wore like H and M and wore tight jeans and crop tops and whatever, and it was like super grungy here. And everybody wore baggy pants, and everybody was like mourning Kurt Cobain. And I was like, who's Kurt Cobain? Like I listened to house music. Yeah. Um. So I didn't fit in, and it was made known to me very quickly that I didn't, and it was just a really hard transition. What was that like, you know, coming here and having like this glorified ideal of Jason Priestley and Nana <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's just like, oh, you're the odd kid and, you know, like you don't fit in in like all these different ways. Like, like how was that or how long did it take you to overcome that or like what were some of the things that happened to kind of get you over that out so you could start to feel comfortable here? Um, I don't know how long it took. I think those are just like hard years. So it's like hard to sort of separate being a teenager and all you're going through from that thing. Um, I was definitely bullied and I definitely got into some fights. And my dad was like, just fight back. Yeah. So I think, and I grew up like watching Rocky movies with my dad. <laughs> and yeah. Like, okay. And I had two older brothers. So I spent have my childhood in the headlock so I could definitely I was scrappy yeah and I think when I was confronted with those things I just kind of fought back and then people left me alone after that and we ended up moving doesn't sound very Beverly Hills now no it wasn't like that at all yeah. I mean I barely spoke I mean I spoke English but they still put me into ESL so I had like four ESL classes was it was it two a day? I don't know. But I remember not going because it was just full of, it was, it was like all these Asian kids who had these little um, translators oh. and me. <laughs> it was like yeah. Burnaby South and it was like before Hong Kong was going to come yeah. back and it was just, so I just, it didn't, it wasn't helping me. So I just started skipping class and I used to go to like the mall and walk yeah. around and I think I learned English mostly through watching TV. Mm -hmm. and skipping my classes, isn't that like, sad? <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but I just didn't belong, and it wasn't helping me, and, um, yeah. Yeah, and then, like, what, like, 13 is, what, grade 9 or grade Grade 8. Grade 8? Grade 8. Yeah. So you still had quite a, or a couple of years to be able to fit into the mold. Like, did you, um, did you ever kind of, like, get into, like, the groove of, like, what you visualized high school would be like here once you got here, or was it just like this crazy ex experience all through high school and then once you graduated that was no it was fine I switched schools the next year because my parents ended up buying a house in Surrey so we moved from Burnaby to Surrey and I switched schools and I got straight A's and I started hanging out with the geeky kids whereas yeah. like the the first year I was kind of like hanging out with like kind of the bad kids yeah. <laughs> that's probably you know why I I was seeing so many more things and so I just kind of got into the groove of like trying to like do well and my best friend who's like now a doctor yeah. um her and i would like academically compete yeah. <laughs> which sounds like it's just super dorky but i had like straight a's through Were you all the years no nope. no no not i mean i went to like the good school in germany like in germany in grade four you take like an IQ test, and they decide what school you're going to go to. Oh. There is like Hauptschule, which is like for people who are going to go into the trades. There's VIA, which is kind of like in the middle. And then there's Gymnasium, which is like that's 13th grade. Then you're going to go to university if you get into Gymnasium. And I think my test was good enough to get me to Gymnasium, but none of the immigrant kids went to Gymnasium. So they put me to Real, and my mom was like, no, no, yeah. there's no reason. And so my mom made sure that I went to gymnasium, and I did okay. But I was, like I said earlier, a Seventh-day Adventist, and in gymnasium you went to school six days a week, and I couldn't go to school on Saturdays. Or I chose not to. Yeah. I could have. My parents would have left me. But um, So I was kind of always falling behind a little bit because I, so I was missing, like, a day, and I also maybe had the little, like, ooh, do I belong here feeling. Like, I wasn't 
not that I wasn't smart, yeah. but... Well, just a lot of transitions at, like, you know, formidable ages, right? You know, where it's the... Yeah, and they didn't want to keep me in that school. They made me take that test again. Oh. And I did really well, and then I ended up staying at that school. Well, and, you know, and what an interesting message to be able to send to a child saying, like, you know, we're going to make you take this test again just to make sure that you should be here instead of, like, fostering that environment and, you know, like, helping them excel. But so, schools in Germany are so different than schools here. <laughs> you know, you know, this is the problem, you know, like when I'm talking, that's the one thing that I that I love and appreciate about talking to the people like you is because you get that perspective because I just assume, like, you know, and like I the only information I have to go on is based on like how it is here and I only really know how it is between like BC and Alberta. Right. You know, but like when people, when you talk about like taking an IQ test Atlantic in a school, here it's like... I'm going to move somewhere into a different geographical area to guarantee that my kid's going to get into this cat or this place because I'm now in the catchment zone for it. Yeah. You know, like no matter what happens. So it's like, what, what do you see behind, like, do you think it's um, advantageous to be able to take an IQ test to place people in school or do you think that it should just be the way that it is here? Like, I mean, I think, think grade four is probably too young to like decide because then in grade five you start to sort of decide what your future should look like or what choices you could make. Um, but I do think I appreciated structure mm -hmm. and I know that I learned way more. And I think part of the reason why I did so well in school here was that it was so easy compared to what I was doing in like grade six in Germany. Yeah. So it just, it wasn't hard. Like I don't think I learned anything new in math to like maybe grade 11. Like really? I wasn't learning anything new. Oh, wow. That's crazy. It was just, it was a lot harder there. Yeah. Hmm. So we kind of have like a, a watered down version of the school experience here. I think so. I hear that quite a bit though. Like our school system, like it may be good in some regards because people have access to education, but the actual ac the education they have access to really is kind of mediocre. I've heard that from a lot of people from around the world. Yeah. So now you're in Surrey going to school, you're competing against your bestie that you're obviously still friends with yeah. now. Yeah. What happened in Surrey? What was Surrey like? It was fine. Like I, my dream was just to not be there. Like I don't think I was very present. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, let's just get through school. Let's get a scholarship. Like let's do this. And I did get a scholarship and I did well. And the biggest thing that happened, I guess, in grade eleven, I went to just a grade eleven, twelve school. I joined theater company there, and so I started directing plays and acting in plays and. That probably took me off the course of like pure academia and just like wanting to do well. Like, well, the nice thing about that is, is it allows you to be able to kind of have like a little bit of a gateway into something that's different than school because now you're getting into that transition of like what you may or may not have to do like later on in life or like what we think would be like the rest of our life. So, you know, it's nice that you have that opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, and I just think. It gave me the confidence to go out and pursue it. Now, whether that was the right choice or the bad choice, I don't know. But I felt like I had enough experiences to be like, yeah, I'm an actor. Or I can yeah. be an actor. I can be a director. I can do these things. So what happened after that? So, like, obviously there's a, a film component that we're going to get into here. So um, after high school, what was it? I went to UBC. And um, I got into the film program there. I was still wanted to be an actor. More than anything, I wanted to be an actor. But I made my first little short film called Bathroom Girl. It was yeah. about this girl who went to rave and just spent her entire time in the bathroom and all the things that happened there. I was raving a little bit through high school, too. Yeah. <laughs> so while I was, like, getting straight A's, I was still, like, raving on the weekend, like mm -hmm. a little double thing. I remember when raves were just kind of, like, the sign of the times. Like, it was just That's the same, like, everybody was going. Well, everybody was doing it in Germany. Like, it wasn't a big deal. And while I lived here, I would go I would go home, like, every second summer, and I would hang out with my friends there and my brothers. And, like, house music was, like, a huge thing. And here, nobody was doing it. And then all of a sudden, these, um, these raves started popping up in Richmond. And I just wanted to dance. Like, it wasn't about anything. It was just, like, can I just go and dance all night? Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you went in places in Europe, like, say, like, Germany, because that's where you have your most experience. Like, like raves are... Back then, they were just... Well, we could just get into it. clubs. Like, when I was in oh. Germany at 15, I could get into a club. Like, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Like, I could get alcohol when I was, like, 13. Like, everything was just accessible. Yeah. It wasn't hard. And this is the age-old question. Do you think that, like, we create a want 
to like, you know, consume like alcohol and drugs and all this kind of stuff because we put such limitations on it, you know, versus it just like, you know, saying like alcohol being like a part of life. Like this is just something that's there, like like milk or food or yeah, going to school. I think like so. it's just you know like I don't know. Like we glorify and it. So as much, many like, people who like binge drink in Europe as I know people who like binge drink here. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah. I, I'm not like a big drinker or anything. It's not like a huge part of my life. I'm like a wonder and wonder. Mm-hmm. But um But the perception of it is totally. so much different, yeah. right? You know, like is we are we're all like okay, well I just Okay, I'm the 18th birthday. It's gonna be like this big thing. Like we're gonna go out, and you know everybody's gonna get trashed. But you've been getting drunk for years before that because you know like obviously nobody's waiting until they're 18. But like you be sneaking around doing stuff. You know asking people to get you alcohol. Like it, it becomes like you know like this thing you're not supposed to be doing, and then you kind of feel like you're getting away with it, and then you want to do it more because you're getting away with something you're not supposed to be doing. And like we create all these like like stigmas and we glorify them and. Like, you hear that amongst people who've grown up in Canada so much. I think it's much much better when you don't have those strict rules about it. And that happens, like, in other countries, too, when they legalize drugs and they become less of a big deal, right? Their Mm -hmm. their drug problems go down, and I think the same could be true for alcohol. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and and this is something that I really like talking about um, with people is the experience of growing up. Because here we do have a lot more of like a rigid system that we call liberal, which isn't really liberal compared to like what liberal is. So you kind of grew up a little bit more in that system. Like when you sit back and you look at the adults that you know in your life now, like do you see how we kind of have like the the wheel to come off the bus for us a little bit because we live in such rigid like systems that, you know, it has to, you know, be this, your life should look like this, you know, like we to your 18 to drink, like just all these components versus just a lot more of like a freer life to be able to make the decisions based on like what you feel is best for you, like what is more like a European model or what seems to be like a European model? I think that's hard for me to answer because most of my friends are artists. So mm-hmm. most of my friends, just because, yeah, you know, like those are my people. So I don't have a lot of friends who have like a very stereotypical life. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you found, you found your niche and you just live in there. Right? I guess. Um, I mean, I do have some friends who have, like, quote-unquote real jobs, but yeah. not too many because I just, early on, I decided, even though I could have gone down, you know, business or political science and I had other ideas, I ended up going down this kind of freelance artistic route and then the people that you attract are also on that path. So I don't... Except for my like my one friend from high school who's a doctor. Yeah. I don't have a lot of like doctor friends yeah. <laughs> or lawyers or whatever. So what happened after the girl in the bathroom? So I got into home school, bathroom girl, and I lasted maybe three months and I hated it. I hated it so much. We were still uh, shooting on film, which now like I could be nostalgic about and be like, oh I'm learning how to like thread sixteen millimeter film. I'm like a bag, but I'm just not a technical person, yeah. so it didn't appeal to me. I shot a little short on like eight millimeter, and they're supposed to like edit it on like steam bags. Like it was like old school. Yeah. And so I just decided to keep pursuing acting, and so I dropped out of film school. I ended up getting like a theater degree, did some creative writing, mm-hmm. just a few things. Like, what was that experience? You know, like for like like connecting with being like an actress, like like what is that? Like what does that mean to you? Like when you see that and you feel that inside you, like what gravitated you toward that? Like why does that speak to you so much? Well, it doesn't speak to me anymore. Or why, yeah, why did <laughs> yeah. it then? Yeah. Um, I think because I was so shy and I had I think especially after that year in like grade eight where I was bullied and I think I was starting to be afraid to express certain sides of myself. So I was just like being nice all the time. I was like, (laughs) it's nice, neutral. And whenever I got to act, I got to express these things and people would be so impressed. Like if I could like cry in a scene, or I could like be really angry and yell. And like, or if you're like really sexy in a scene or like any of those things, people are so impressed by you. Yeah. And when you do that in real life, people are like, what's wrong with you, right? Why are you crying? Like, why are you so angry? And so it just allowed me to be all these things mm-hmm. and be appreciated for them. Yeah, which and is I kind of like that, the human experience, right? Yeah. Just being emotional. And I think the more you allow yourself to be something, 
even if it's like in the guise of like a character, the more you can embrace it in yourself. You're like, okay, well, I can also just be sad right now. That's fine. Yeah. Or I could be sexy or I could be whatever that is. The more you allow yourself to be it on stage as someone else, the more you can own it as part of like yourself. Well, I think it allows us that opportunity to realize that like, and again, this comes back to like my experience living here is that, you know, in the 36 years that I've been alive, I've I've predominantly spent like 99.9% of that in, in Canada, again, between like Alberta and BC, but it's like, you should tote this specific line, you know, kind of like, how you act, you know, like emotional response, you know, like the degree of emotional response, like all these like different facets. And, but, you know, like there's that, if there's ever like hard pendulum swings in any way, like you're excessively happy, you're excessively yeah. sad, you're excessively angry, it, it becomes, we want to label that. Like, you know, like what is going on? Like what is wrong? Like, you know, like what's going on in your life right now versus that that's just really kind of who we are. And it's really like help, what's allowed us to survive up until this point, you know, right? Is being able to have like these, emotional responses and attachments to things but i feel like we try to sterilize a a lot of that in today's world right yeah i think a lot of people can't handle emotion my dad was like that my dad had the hardest time like whenever i cried he was so upset like he just could not handle it Mm -hmm. and um yeah yeah and you know and a lot of that too is like do you think that we've done that you know because it's easier to deal with, you know, because like, you know, as dad, like I have three girls and I find it to be like, that's, you know, like I want them to be able to be as free to be able to be themselves, but because you have like these three, like ruthlessly authentic personalities, because like how young they are, I'm just like, oh my God. How old are they? Uh, two, four, and eight. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So like, they're just like at the peak of individual expression zero filters don't know like and not that they shouldn't i don't want them to either but just seeing like how different all three of their personalities are in like in any one given time like between the four of us when we're around it's like okay there's a lot going on right now you know but like i would rather that than when i see it's just like you know sit be proper this is how you should look you know shirt press fork this way like i just I was never raised like that. So like, I don't connect with it at all. And when I see it, like it just doesn't feel right to me. So I don't want them to think that that's right either. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. I think that's part of going back to like earlier in the conversation and rewilding, right. And just Mm -hmm. being authentic selves. Like I didn't grow up like that. Like just being seventh day Adventist, there was like a lot of like, there's like the church front that you put up and what you're supposed to look like. And I remember, uh, to no fault of my parents, they were just doing what, they thought was best but I remember when we would go back home to Romania to visit like I wasn't allowed to tell my my grandparents that I did ballet right like that was like because there were so many secrets there was always like there's there's certain things that we do and that we don't do and and I think that's true for emotions too there's so many things we don't talk about and I think that's why acting was so great was that I just got to express a lot of things um whatever like because psycho- psychologically you only have like your backstory and your thing that you know you kind of express while you're acting while you're saying somebody else's lines yeah what's that like so is that an environment that you're still in like if you like do you talk to your grandparents or your grandparents still around like my I grandparents was... aren't alive yeah um, as of like last year um no and i started owning who i am like i remember I mean, I started telling them I was an actor, which was like, uh, and my mom's like, she's a teacher, and that's true too, because I teach acting. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I was just owning myself and what I was about, mm-hmm. and I wasn't, certainly by the time I was 18, I wasn't part of like church in mm-hmm. any capacity, and I didn't pretend. Was that like, maybe, like your choice, or like, do it? So, like, what was. There like a little bit of break in the faith when you guys like moved to Germany. I know like... it didn't have nothing to do with the with the moving. My brother committed suicide when he was twenty four. I was eighteen at the time, and um, it's just the way that that specific religion looks at suicide, and I just couldn't for the life of me believe in like heaven and hell anymore like that just like made no sense to me and um because my brother was like yeah he had like huge problems obviously 
Um, but he was also like one of the coolest, like most generous, like loving people ever. So for me to start labeling what he did as like unforgivable just was like, no, yeah. I can't, I can't. Um, so that really was like the big breaking point for me. There were other things, but that was like. See, it always like for me when I think it's like I'm not, uh, I'm not, I don't have uh, like a faith that I follow, like per se. Um, but the one thing that I always have the the toughest part when it comes to heaven and hell is that if you struggle in this life for whatever reason that you struggled for, and even say that you are just the worst human being on the planet, why not offer the reprieve of that? Like, why should it be, like, contingent on doing something here to be able to help change circumstances? Because you might not be able to. And why not just allow somebody to be, like, to not shoulder that burden anymore? You know, or, like, why live in fear here? Because, like, you don't want to end up in the place where yeah. all those people are. Like, that's what I would say. Because, like, either way you're being persecuted. Yeah, it was just a big break of faith for me, period. Not just from religion. Like, I was really trying to become an atheist <laughs> like yeah. I tried real hard I failed yeah but um but yeah I just sort of like I, I didn't want to believe in anything at that point mm-hmm. what was all this like on your your parents because obviously they moved probably for them but also to give you guys like yeah. a different quality of life like um like was it was the transition hard like on everybody because you think like that is a lot of change because you mentioned that you it's you and three other siblings yeah. and then your mom and your dad and then there's like this faith culture there's this con this political culture there's these like entrenched obligations like it must have been really tricky to it was really tricky kind of know how to like <laughs> navigate that. I was gonna say I feel like I always feel like my life got like easier as an adult when I started mm-hmm. being able to make my own decisions and it just became a lot easier. Um, I think for my parents moving to Canada was great. My dad's dad had been a business owner. My dad had never met his dad. He he died at the end of World War II, uh, just before he was born. But he had sort of this legacy of like being a business owner, and that's what he was about. And then he lived in a communist country, and he couldn't do that. But he was trying to do that. He was trying to do import export and communist, which is why he ended up leaving. Mm-hmm. And in Germany again. Auslander immigrant wasn't allowed couldn't do his thing so then coming to Canada he could finally like become sort of who he wanted to be and he was like he must have been like 50 by the time he moved to Canada right and he didn't speak English and he just started making furniture in our garage and that turned into a business and then he had 10 employees and it like really grew and fulfilled and my mom too was like as soon as we got here as soon as we got here my mom just like felt really at home she felt a lot of freedom so i think for my parents it was really good i think that they were able to like really work hard and see the the results of that here and so yeah i think that they were super happy i think for me it was much harder just because i was at that age Mm -hmm. but in hindsight i'm like happy i'm here well that in looking back on it you know because like hearing stories like that when when we all complain about how, you know, like, I wish I had this right now or that right now, or like, we have all these comparisons, but then you hear something like what you just shared, and somebody who's kind of traveled around the world, they're in their 50s, and finally got to that point where they feel like themselves. But like, again, when we're here, it's like, okay, well, by 18, you should have it figured out. You should know what you want to go to, like, you know, post-secondary education for, and then you're going to do that for the rest of your life. You're going to collect your 25-year watch, and you're going to retire when you're 65. It's like, well, what if it took you two-thirds of that entire lifetime to be able to get to the point where you feel the most happy, and we refuse to, like, even geographically locate? And I find it to be so ironic, because, like, that's how, like, our countries over here were formed, is people chasing, like, a dream, then we got handed this gift and we got bestowed upon this obligation to say, live and be free. And then we're just like, but this box is so much better. But we still have people coming over here all the time, like living the experience that we could be living too, you know, where somebody like, again, think of how many times people could give up before they got to 50 and just be like, okay, I'm going to pack it in. Okay. Like I've gone 
from you know like Romania where we where I lived my entire life and I've gone to the Germany, I still can't do it and then finally like I'm gonna like relocate halfway across the world chasing the same thing, hoping that that might be the place where I could do it and then finally find it. Yeah. You know, but we're like, oh I'm not even gonna go to like Victoria. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think that, that my parents gave me that gift of being fearless. Especially my dad. He um he was really fearless. Um, and I, you know, I'm not, I have a lot of like just intrinsic fear inside of me, but I'm able to most of the time step, step yeah. out of it, even though it's like intrinsic in me. Yeah. What are, if, if you know, I know that this always kind of gets to the personal part for like most people, but like, what are, what are some of those things that you, like you harbor that you have to live with that kind of like hold you back or like they're the, the monkeys on your back? And you can just be like, this no, is... no, no, it's, it's not too personal at all. I just have like intrinsic perfectionism in me. So sometimes I just don't do things because I need them to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I think while I was pursuing acting, there were lots of times I was just afraid of being bad, like mm -hmm. at it, even though like, I knew I was like good at it. And people were telling me I, I did. Like every time I stepped into an audition room, it was just, I was just scared. Yeah. And I couldn't step beyond, I don't know. It's just sometimes getting started with things, I'm just intrinsically scared. Mm -hmm. And then when I do it, I'm fine. And it's ironic because I used to like hate public speaking so much. And now, you know, I teach for a living. I'm always in front of a different group of people. I'm always talking to people. I'm always, like, doing this thing. Mm -hmm. But for me, that was used to be, like, the scariest. But it's still there and like, Well, ways. because we're not supposed to be in front of such big <laughs> groups of people. Like, it would be, like, you think for, like, all the years that, you know, whether you want to think it's, like, a few thousand years to a few hundred thousand years, like, we've never been around forums where it's, like, I'm going to talk to these thousand people or these five thousand people. These, like, it might be 10 or 50 or like 125. I think kind of like the, the golden number that like people are supposed to be like kind of in our immediate communities, but like 120 to 125 or something like that would be the biggest, like that yeah. would be public speaking is if you spoke to all of those people and very rarely would anybody ever do that. You know, maybe like the chief of like a tribe, yeah. right? You know, but when we kind of look at like us now, we're kind of almost a failure if we are not born with that. And again, like that's that, you know, overvaluing, overvaluing extroverted personalities, you know, here saying like, you need to be, you know, like that social person, you need to be able to be that person. Like we have things like Toastmasters to coach people to, you know, be able to public speak, but like, what if you just don't like it? You know, like, is, is that like, okay? <laughs> yeah, you know, like, yeah, I think it's okay. I don't think that that specifically still stands mm -hmm. in my way, but I think just the, fear of getting something wrong. Sometimes mm -hmm. I just don't do it. I'm like, oh, what if I do it badly? Yeah. I know that like, there's nothing wrong with doing something badly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that there's nothing wrong with failure. That's how you learn. But I think intrinsically, I just want to stop sometimes. And it, it's funny that like, you know, we all have those like inhibitions and in it's like, we will stop something before we start because of it, how we feel, even though that we know that's wrong to think like that or, you know, to like act like that. But like, we still, you know, like, like those primal instincts that we have in us that just say like, no, stop before you do this. Like even, you know, like your mind is like, I know, but it's silly. Like, you know, like I can, I have the ability for air to come out of my mouth and it sound like something that other people can understand. So why can't I communicate that to like a hundred people or like, no, like why not go act? Because like people tell me I'm good at it. I know that I'm good at it. I love it. But like, there's this part that's just like, maybe we should just go sit down right now. You know, it's just. I find it funny because we all have that. Every single human being on this planet has those things. But then also I think people get stuck in pursuing one thing and they don't allow themselves to like move on. Mm -hmm. Also just kind of like fear of judgment. And I think I got to a point with the pursuit of acting and filmmaking where I was like, oh, is this my dream like right now? Like... I'm 35 and I'm like trying to live like my five-year-old dream. Also yeah. like able to like let go of dreams and like create new dreams. Yeah. I think it's like a really big deal and then pursuing new things. 
and allowing yourself the opportunity to be able to change your dreams and goals. Because yeah. I just launched a podcast like earlier in the weekend. It's called Fuck Goals. You know, because, <laughs> you know, like really it, it kind of touched on like, you know, like what you were just saying is that, you know, that you grew up thinking this thing, you know, and like I had a few different references, you know, but like one of the references that I was like, okay, well, you know, you're going to grab like this 40 pound dumbbell and you're going to lift it. So you think it's 40. So it, it should be heavy. Okay. Well, if it's heavy, I don't know if I'm strong enough to feel to lift it. We go through this whole process to get to it. Then by the time we try to lift it, it becomes heavy. Yeah. You know, so it's like with you, you know, where you're like, okay, well, Beverly Hills now 2 and all, you need to make sure you this thing, and I get to UBC, I'm going to act. And it's like affording yourself this sobering opportunity, like, it's okay if I don't want to do that anymore. Like, it doesn't change the course of my life any to be able to change that goal. It doesn't make me a success, doesn't make me a failure, just this is a part of life. And I think it, it brought me a lot of, like, really cool things, and I think... Like, I lived in New York for a couple of years and pursued it there, and it's allowed me to go to a lot of, like, cool places and become more of who I am, and at a certain point, I was just done. What was the New York experience like? It was great. It was theater school, so I got to act, like, 24-7. I got to confront myself, like, 24-7, but it was great um, because that city is so alive. And it has so much energy, and I was still at, like, the age where I could thrive on that, like, that many people and that much energy. Like, I couldn't do that now. But I was going to say, like, your, your presence doesn't seem like that just hustle and bustle of New York right now. Like, like clearly no, you've made, for like, sure. a shift. Right? <laughs> but I, I loved it there. Like, I remember when I... When I moved back, it was like, oh my god, it's so slow here. What's going on? What's going on? No, but yeah, when I was pursuing acting and filmmaking, I definitely had a different energy. Mm-hmm. Where uh, where else? You said it, it took you multiple places. Where else? Besides I mean, that's York? where I lived. I lived in New York for two years. But just in terms of, it takes you to places. Like, every time you make a movie, like, you have this, mm-hmm. you build, like, a new kind of community, family, and you have this experience with people. And, um, yeah, I don't regret any of those things. Well, and again, like, it, it gives you the chance to be able to share that with people now. You know, because, you know, I, I think, like, you, what we're talking about right now is something that, like, we both, like, kind of, like, dabbled into is, like, allowing the opportunity for change, knowing that it's good for us, it's healthy for us, it's something that we should be doing, but we should allow ourselves to feel okay with that. And it's an environment that we should foster for everybody. But, like, we don't. You know, because again, like it comes back to that whole, you know, I'm going to join this union. I'm going to work this job for 20, 25 years. And like all of our grandparents and our parents, like that's how they grew up. And I was just talking about this with one of my clients who um, owns like a, an extremely large company. And, you know, we, we were talking about how like people come and go all the time. And I'm like, I don't know how you deal with it because like you want this core group of people to be able to rely on. But like that core group of people is even very transient now. Because nobody cares about staying. Like, there's no pride in staying somewhere for five years. There's no pride in staying somewhere for ten years. And I used to feel really almost guilty for not having like nine to five and not working like regular people do. Because I have obviously friends who like have good jobs and make a good living, and and I'm constantly just yeah. Like, every term looks different. Like I, I sort of live my life in like three months chunks, mm-hmm. and so. But that's how we should, though. Like, that's how... But I don't know if everybody can handle that. I think we can't handle it because we are overly coached and trained to not live like that. You know, but if we look at one thing that we know, well, your diet in the summer should not be the same as in in the winter. Yeah. You know, like, we know these things. Like, you're not going to dress the same as you are in the summer as you are in the winter. Like, Like, all of these things change, but, like, we want these things because we think there's reassurance in it. I do think, though, that routine is really great for people, and I think a lot of people can thrive under those routines. Absolutely. I know that sometimes when I have a little bit of routine, I'm like, oh, I understand why these people like have their nine to fives, and it makes sense to me on some level. I and just can't do it. Yeah, no, and like, and like I said, it's not that I, I totally disagree, because like, you know, my idea is full of like meetings and appointments and schedules, and like there's like this routine, but you know, like, I look at it as that there's a lot of people who get caught up in like living a very unhealthy life because like the what they think and like what it should be is that even if I don't like this, 
I have to keep on doing it because it's like this ideal, which is like that routine. Okay, I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna go to this job I don't like, I'm gonna be around these people I don't like because there's just there's not the affordance of like mobility and like breaking that mold and saying, okay, well, it might not be seasonal change, but like seasonal change can come by way of like, you know, how we kind of change every 10 years in our lives. You know, but like, so if I'm going to do the same thing at 20 as I am when I'm 50, there's probably a chance that there's something a little skewed there, right? And that's where I look at it. But like more people are kind of getting into that late now. And I see people just kind of, I guess, maybe being 36 now where like almost everybody around me is questioning everything. They're like, well, I think it's also that this, like the sign of the times, like what's happening in Australia right now, why we have this crazy weather here right now. So if we're looking at like global warming and we're looking at how fast the earth is changing, I think this illusion that people have of their security is disappearing. Mm -hmm. So then they're forced to kind of look beyond it because they're like, oh, well, Maybe my retirement fund doesn't matter as much. Well, that and it's like you make a good point where we're all kind of, you know, getting pretty close to 40 or 40. And then, you know, you always have like <laughs> this like looming like, OK, well, you know, I should have enough to be able to retire by the time I'm 60 or 65. And like, you know, so like you feel like the looming aspect of like, have I achieved enough of my life to this point in time? And but like, what is achievement? So what is su- success? I don't like, know. I'm, I mean, I'm hearing you and like a year or maybe two years ago, I would have been so like, yes, mm-hmm. because I think I had these things in my mind that I felt like I needed to achieve, but like they just, they're gone. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't know. Like I used to be like such an ambitious person. I'm still like quite an ambitious person, but I don't have specific things up on a board anymore that I need to like hit. Mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm okay. very, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and I feel like that's where, like, the, like, for me, finding, like, the structure and the routine and just knowing that I'm going to wake up every day just to want to really appease myself. And that allows me to be able to be happy, which makes me live a better life, which makes people around me have a better quality of life. And that's become so much more abundantly, um, a priority to me in the last couple of years than what it ever has because when I had all these ideas of okay I'm going to work towards this this is what I want in this point I'm like it just I really lost the things that I loved so much and I the one thing I couldn't stand is saying to people and hearing other people say I used to love doing this or like I did this when I was a kid all the time or like you know I wish I had more time to be able to do this and I'm like well why aren't we like like what gets to be that point where we limit ourselves so much, where we recognize the things that make us happy, but we feel like we can't do them based on the social standard of what we're living. So that's why, like for me, you know, like on the weekend, you know, things like we'll do like regularly, you know, like grab a couple of beers, hike up Cypress at like yeah. twelve o'clock at night, and go to Bogney <laughs> until three o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm can like, I get an invite to that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but like that, cider. yeah, like that kind of stuff to me is like. Well, and people are just like, well, you guys are like in your 30s and 40s. And I'm like, exactly. I should get a point in time where I can do this and have fun and not feel guilty for doing it. Like, why not? Like, it, like those are the kind of things where like what you said were, you know, like yesterday, although it was like a snow day from like school, like as we know with, with the kids and stuff, I'm like, I used to feel really guilty during the middle of the day, even if like I had to stay home like with my kids, like from school and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, you're like, I should be working right now. Like I should be doing this. But then also realizing, well, on a Saturday afternoon when I'm working, I feel like I shouldn't be working because it's Saturday afternoon. You're always kind of like in this flux, but I feel like I've let all of that go. And when I've let all of that go, it kind of washed away all this nine to five vision board, you know, short term goal, medium range goal, long term goal. That's kind of exhausting. Like, yeah, because I've been <laughs> spend so much time. Okay, well, I made this vision board. Okay, well, where am I at? Okay, it's like, you know, we're in second quarter of the year now and there's this vision board. Okay, well, where am I to be able to, like, achieving this? You know, okay, well, now I feel guilty because I haven't really achieved, like, all these things I thought at the beginning of the year were important but maybe not necessarily going to be important now, but now I'm not accomplishing them. So it's like, <laughs> what else not being accomplished versus just, like, I want to have some shoes. I want to go hit up the backcountry. I want to laugh with people. I want to have yeah. fun. And it's like there's so much of life that can revolve around that and, like, we still be – successful but it's like changing kind of like what our definition of success is and if we're really living together where we like 
love each other and respect each other in this community, it shouldn't matter of having enough by 60 or 65, because if we're all kind of collectively living together, you know, like there should be enough means and opportunity for us all to be able to live in that environment and, and be successful. And you haven't been saving and this also, because like, you're 20. And, the, the idea of like, oh, like looking forward to doing nothing. Like yeah. I'm not looking forward to like doing nothing at 65. That sounds mm-hmm. awful. Like I don't want to sit at home and watch TV. Like yeah. that doesn't sound like yay. Like I hope I'm still teaching yoga. I'm hope I'm still like giving nutrition advice. And in totally and killing it. Yeah. Right? Like so there isn't that. Like I don't need to retire whatever mm-hmm. because like I love what I do. Yeah. And the thing is, and, and loving the aspect that that could change in a year from now or five years from now and just like affording yourself that opportunity and then that'll allow you to be able to be 70 doing something that you love. You know, because you look at how many, um, you know, baby boomers work at um, like Home Depot or, you know, something like that now because they realize staying at home and doing nothing once you get to a certain point is boring. You know, like just wasting your life away. Like, why not? There's so many hours in a day. Why not get out and do something and have a little bit of fun? Right? Yeah, and people need to connect, right? They need like human connection and they need movement. There's certain things that will just like make us feel better. So you mm-hmm. can't just yeah even like sit on a beach. <laughs> like yeah. you like need more. So how did you uh, like? You know, you came back to like Vancouver from New York. What was the what was the stage of your life? You know, between yeah, I've come back to Vancouver from New York, and now I'm into like yoga, holistic wellness. Like, what well, there's definitely that? like a solid chunk of time pursuing acting. Mm-hmm. I came back from New York because I knew I was going to be able to get an agent here much faster, right? It's just like a bigger process in New York because it's yeah. just a different game. So I did. I came back. I got an agent. I made a short film with a friend. We produced together. I starred in it. We got some Leo nominations. And then I made another film. I started writing my own stuff just because I wasn't getting in the auditioning room. Like people just didn't want to see me. Uh, I'm too Eastern European. I sound too whatever. And so I just started creating my own work. And I found a lot of joy in creating my own work. Uh, I should send you some films. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that went. So that process was going well, and so there was like writing, directing, producing, and those things were happening, but I could never crack acting. Like I could start star my own films, and like people, like I got great feedback when I was doing that, but for some reason I just couldn't, nobody wanted to see me. And it was like, ah, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And it always came back to what you look like, what you don't look like, what you sound like, what you don't sound like. Just things that I can't change about myself. Or I could, but at like such extremes. Yeah. And um, Was that ever hard? Like, was it ever Of course. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't imagine being like... You constantly... Yeah. Like, if somebody was like, you know, um, if I'm like, oh, I want to play squash, and like, you're not good enough to hold the racket, and I'd be like, huh? You know, like, I don't even understand. You know, like, I, like, I couldn't imagine living the, in that the, kind of environment. The thing was, I was, I've, I had always been directing, so I was all, and I have a master's degree in acting, so it was like a stupid thing to have a master's degree in, but I was always coaching people, so I was helping people book these parts and like big movies and big TV shows, so I was always really close to the flame. Like, I was helping people get there, and I would be on set coaching, too, sometimes, but I could just never get there. They wouldn't even let me in the room to, like, mm-hmm. you know, just even try. And I just hit a point where I was like, well, then I don't want to. Because it's like, and also I think the longer I was in the industry, the, the more friends I had who were, like, really successful, like, they're starring on TV shows, and they're really successful, and they're not any happier than me. Right, mm-hmm. they still kind of have the same kind of thing. So I'm like, oh, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. I'm like, but I see these people there, and they're not any happier. So I'm like, maybe I need to like get somewhere else. Like maybe this isn't it. And yeah, I mean specifically, what shifted for me was an experience I had um, in Africa. I went and climbed Mount Kilimanjaro with a friend. It was like our friend anniversary. The same friend I was talking about. Jesse, yeah. who was like my high school competitive uh, friend. Um, so we went and we climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, and yeah, I just felt really strong. Like it's a big mountain, yeah. <laughs> and it's like really hard conditions. And 
you know, I was playing these mental games with myself to get up there, and it just, it wasn't that hard, like, and I felt real good, and coming home from that experience, and then having a conversation about what I look like, was just so stupid, mm-hmm. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to care. Yeah, and, I, and it's funny that you say that, because what really shapes the landscape of my day and my life have is being through going through experiences where I've almost died and realizing that all these things I'm going through like in comparison to those are like it just doesn't even make any sense. I didn't almost die. <laughs> no, but I just but, no, I mean, but like, yeah, I've, but I've just, happened to yeah. be in like I feel like, you know, I, I've talked about this, this podcast before, but it's like you know, like sitting in a cave, realizing you have hypothermia, and filming a video that you're going to die. Like, and then when you're just wow. like, when somebody's like, "My boss is such an asshole," I'm like, "Ah, yeah." Like, I don't doubt it. You know, yeah. but like, I just like I realized that like these environments, like what we stress about now versus some of the things that are like real or like a real challenge. Like, we're like I said, like climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Like, there's a lot of different. It's not only like the altitude, but you know, it's the, it's like, you know, you go through like heat, you go through extreme wind, you go through extreme cold, you're like, you know, your progression and regression for acclimation, like there's all of these things you have to go through, like those, those things are real, you know, like somebody not being very nice, like it just like. <laughs> it also really started my sort of like love affair with being outside. Mm-hmm. It was about four years ago that I went and it really just started this like, I I had no business climbing Kilimanjaro. I had done like the Chief and the the Grand. <laughs> so how did you guys settle on that one? Like, who's uh, uh, was it? I had some friends who had done it. Um, just the, in 2010, they had done it when I was just moving back from New York, and I just didn't have the money to go with them because I was just moving back and just needed to start my life over here. And so I didn't go, and they had had this amazing trip, and they did Kilimanjaro and a safari, yeah. and um, they had. Uh, gone to Zanzibar and it just like was like such a trip of a lifetime so I was like I want to do that yeah. and so we had settled on that and um, I knew I was strong like I've run a marathon before at that point mm-hmm. I've run a couple things but I knew I could like do it and it's walking it's really walking yeah. with a little bit of resistance so like and that's always my point and like what we're talking about like with BRI like when you say like I had no business doing it and I more look at it like you had no business not doing it because like it's it's walking with a little bit of resistance. I just meant like they yeah. should have probably been like something in between like Kilimanjaro yeah. and the chief, right? But does it really <laughs> make you realize though like how like our potential as human beings, like the barriers that we separate, like you say, there should have been something in between, but there clearly didn't need to be? No. No, it's fine. I mean, yeah. I did fine. I mean, there were definitely people who were struggling more and yeah. um, I don't yeah. know. It was just a good time. Awesome. What was like, what were some of the stories? Like, what were, um, like, was it just straight success the whole time? Or was there like some, something you'd lose some gear? Like, was it no, kind of food, we, we, altitude I mean, sickness? I had no altitude sickness. My friend did, though. She mm-hmm. really struggled up. And I would say she's generally in better shape than me, but she just really struggles with altitude. And she had done um, Machu Picchu before. So she knew she was going to be struggling with altitude. So she brought altitude medication. And I had brought it with me. I just never took it. Because I'm always like all natural all the time, <laughs> like yeah. as much as you can. I bought it just in case, but I just I went in there with like a really strong mindset. I think there was a little bit of fear, but like tiny. I just sort of knew that I would. And the only really hard day is the last day, right? Mm-hmm. Like you hike all day, and then you take like a little baby nap, and then they like wake you up, and then you start hiking again at midnight because they mm-hmm. want you to go up for the sunrise. And I think it's a blessing that it's so dark, so you can just kind of see your footsteps. And it's just really cold. And they're like, you know, we'll walk for an hour, we'll take a break. Eventually, we'll walk for half an hour and take a break. And then we'll take a break after every step. And you're like, what? You're <laughs> crazy. And I just remember getting to that point where you kind of wanted to, like, stop after every. And so I just started counting, like, 10 steps in my head. Yeah. And then I was sick of counting. And then I was like, um, strong as my legs, strong as my heart strong as my will strong as the mountain strong and I would just like use words and just rip off them to just keep yeah. going but that sort of single-minded focus is like such a cool place to be yeah I think it's rare that we get pushed to extremes physically 
And while it's hard, it's also really joyous to know that you can keep going further. So I was just like playing these mind games and like really just enjoying it. And then you get to like the top and you think you're done. And then it's like another hour and a half to the top top, which that was probably the slowest I went where I really was just like, okay, let's go. Yeah. Um, Why did it build the connection between like you and being outside, you and nature? Like when you look back on it, if you have to like assess it being like, well, it built this connection with me, but like why and like how come? I think part of it was too that we were camping. I mean, this is like, I really believe in just like earthing and grounding. And I think the opportunity to like sleep on the earth, right? Like I never do that. And I think, so we did that while we did Kelly and then we did that during the safari too. So it was just like two weeks basically of just like sleeping on the earth and like not just anywhere, sort of like in Africa and like wild camps where you can hear like the lions in the distance. I almost had a run in with a buffalo one night (laughs) where I was like, uh, because I was going to the bathroom and it was dark out and I just turned my headlamp off and like retreated and I'm like, went to the gut. And I was like, I think I saw a cow and they're like, there's no cows here. I was like, okay. Um, So because everything, everything was stripped away. I didn't have anything for two weeks. I mean, I had my phone with me that I took pictures on, but I wasn't connected to anything. It was just like me and my friend and these friends we were making. Yeah. And you know, and like when, because I, I meet so many people on the trail and like so many people in the backcountry. And the, the one thing that I know, like I the few times I've been like really deep, like, like doesn't even make any sense that you'd see another human being, you know, and like. And you're seeing like almost nothing at that point in time. Like I always joke around with people, like there's a lot less wildlife in the wild than what people realize, right? <laughs> and uh, but then I'll run across like these people and we'll kind of like look at each other and like, how are you here? Like I'm here to get away from your kind, which I know is my <laughs> kind, but I'm like, but like, why are you here? Then it's like that moment where you realize, oh, you know, like if anybody is my people this person is my person yeah. and then you have like a five minute conversation with them or like an hour long conversation and it's like they're always so memorable and you know and like like we said like just feet on the ground you know like bum on the earth you know like looking around and you know like this last summer like when I was like I realized that I'm sitting on top of this mountain peak and I'm like you know mountains really kind of bring it all together like it's this like just absurdly destructive forth like the earth's crust (laughs) smashing together and bursting out of the water and coming out of the ground it's like form these mountains and then you look down and there's nothing more peaceful than sitting on the top of a mountain looking at all of like the different mountain ranges and it's like how much of that is just life like that is literally the representation of life and i feel like that like my mountains in my life have been formed and now I'm just kind of at the top looking out at like the rest mm. of it. And I feel so grateful to feel to be there because I didn't know how much I wanted to be there. But now that I am, I was like, oh, okay, you know, but that's what makes it so hard about, you know, raising children in this kind yeah. of like environment because like you battle the status quo and you're breaking the mold. But... Yeah. Just to be fair, like, as somebody who, like, was, like, such an introvert, loved reading, loved watching movies, mm-hmm. just had, like, no time for the outside, and my parents, yeah. like, really, really tried, <laughs> yeah. I think it's about, like, finding it in your own terms. Absolutely. You know? I think it's it's okay if kids want to spend a ton of time, like, watching sleep. You know, mm-hmm. we all evolve, and I think the more you, like, try to make them like something, the less likely they are to like it probably yeah and i'm kind of more like um i guess the like let's not be in a structured activity and like let's just go hang outside you know like okay well we're going to do math homework but like we can go do it at the park you know like we don't have to eat at the kitchen table you know we can eat at the floor we can go for a picnic you know like just like breaking all those kind of things that seem very like odd to most people but i think that that is happening i feel like i even 
some of my friends who aren't super outdoorsy, they're signing up their kids to like outdoor preschool. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I think people are starting to understand mm -hmm. that it's just necessary and that we're part of nature too. I yeah. think people just kind of disassociate themselves from it, but like we need to be in mm -hmm. it because we're part of it. Yeah. It is kind of interesting to think there's this big degree of separation between like the biological us and the biological everything else and thinking that we are so much different and shouldn't be a part of that just biological experience. I think the more time you spend in it, the like the better you feel, the more time you want to spend in it. Yeah. A friend of mine last year was mocking me while we were on a hike and she's like, you know what, your business isn't going as well as you want it to be. I was like, why? She's like, you like your life too much. She's like, what? Yeah. She's like, you'd rather be out for a run. You'd rather be out for a hike. I was just like, yeah, actually, yeah. because it makes me feel good. And I just try to look at things and like, do I have enough? And usually the answer is yes. So if we are like at enough. Yeah. Then, like, yeah, use the rest of your time and energy to, like, live and enjoy. And if you have 80 years or 90 years to be able to create the quote-unquote enough long-term yeah. and not 60 years, well, that alone creates, like, so much more opportunity yeah. to be able to create whatever enough means. Because, again, like, to me, it's, it's like what we kind of, like, allude to this, this whole, like, retirement at 60 or 65 is under the presumption that, like, I hate what I'm doing so much, I have to immediately stop at a certain age. But I don't want to live my life like that. And a lot of people just say the same thing to me too, because they're just like, you're where right now? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, you're in Richmond right now. <laughs> yeah, or in, and it's just like, you know, like, because I have like this this hike that I want to do from Maple Ridge to Whistler, you know, kind of go through like Mount yeah. Ridges. And it's like, when I look at things like that, like, I want it to be like a Tuesday afternoon that like I set off and like I want to do it like all through like two work week, just to be able to break that mold of saying like, when you come back, nothing really has changed you know because if you're just open and it's like a saturday morning and you're doing something like work related or like a sunday afternoon or you do it until you're 70 or 75 like i'm comfortable with all of that like i don't have to try to fit something in between a monday to friday schedule between a nine to five day like i'm i'm open to like anything anytime and hopefully for like the duration of my life and i don't have to get to a saturation point where i just need to stop it all like, I want to be, like, 92, living on my yeah. own, independent, and then get sick and pass away. Yeah. I think it's important. I think that adventure is, like, such a cool thing. And often people go on, like, vacation, but they don't go on an adventure. Like, mm -hmm. I've traveled, too, with, with other people. And I'm just like, oh, we're at a resort. Oh, we're here. And it's just, like, it's the same thing. It's about, like, consuming and buying and, like, consuming yeah. more and buying more and... I think that that's where we're outside is so important for me because I think it's always an adventure because you don't control the elements. Yeah, yeah. And there isn't something the always in your face trying to tell you, like, you need me to feel better. Yeah. Right? Because a tree isn't telling you, yeah. like... And I love the feeling of being insignificant. You know, like, when, mm. when you're back and you just... Because, like, when I take people into the back country, because it's just kind of, like, where now I've been afforded the luxury of, like you know, um, being able to take people and like kind of blending like something that I love, offering that experience to somebody else and actually is like as a part of my business, right? Um, but when people have never felt insignificant before and they go and they see vastness, like when you look mm -hmm. out at something and you can't see life is the way that we know it anymore. When like cities are gone, cars are gone, planes are gone, other people are gone, like cell phone reception is gone. And you look out and it's just like, mountains or ocean that never ends you're just like ooh, like yeah it's like you realize how small of a world that we live in right? it's really interesting because yeah i've had that feeling but i don't think it's like predominantly what i feel mm -hmm. is insignificant like i feel i feel the most connected mm -hmm. right just to everything whereas well I know, these are just these things, they're like these foreign things, but yeah. when I'm like outside, the things around me just feel real. So I, I was thinking, as soon as you started talking, and then you started like looking around, I was going to ask you, and you kind of just that, do you feel like when you're out in nature, you actually feel these things are around you to serve as purpose, and then you look around, and it's like, okay, well, like this TV is kind of cold, and like this floor doesn't really make sense, this carpet doesn't make like. Like, I don't feel connections to things that 
you know, but like when you spend time in like in the back in the back of tree and like hiking and all that kind of stuff, like when I look at a tree, like it feels useful to yeah. me. Like when I see water, it feels useful. When I just look at a mountain, I'm like it feels useful. Like you feel like there's this connection there with all those kind of things. Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. And it's not like because I've done psychedelics, so like whatever I just yeah. have these like energetic experiences with them. But I do. I just feel really, really energized by it. Yeah. So how, how and I feel it's presence in like some way that like I don't feel with the things in my in my living room. <laughs> so was it like within the last four years, like the kind of yoga, um, you know, like the the shift into more like in the Eastern modalities? Like where did that shift c- come from? Or like I've always had it. Mm-hmm. Like it's always been like even as early as like twenty three. I was gonna like, oh, am I gonna pursue acting filmmaking am i going to pursue nutrition health it's just been a really big interest and love of mine i've grown up vegetarian my whole life i've never had meat so that's like had like an impact on me and just the way i view food and um my dad had cancer when i was 23 and he ended up passing away and i tried to get him on like a raw food diet and this like whole thing i made a documentary about him which i firmly met like it was just this like Thing, but while we were doing the documentary, I went to the Canadian School of Natural Nutrition just because I wanted to, you know, be able to like infuse it with knowledge, not just like yeah. <laughs> my random opinions. Yeah. And so it was born there. Like I had this desire to help people with their food because I think food is like such a huge part of our well-being Absolutely. not just food like i think it's like food and hydration and movement and rest like mm-hmm. those four things need to really come together but food can be so powerful in that because like when my eating is off like yeah. i'm off yeah. right like you can so i've always wanted to help people with that but i also have these like leftover ambitions and dreams that i just have to like pursue first i guess yeah there was a lot of and some of the things I wanted were like genuine and I wanted to create art, create art and tell stories and it came from a really good place and some of it was also really like superficial mm-hmm. and I think I just needed to burn that flame out. Yeah. Do you see like like an amalgamation of those two things like you like at any point? I hope like, one day. Like a yeah. country documentary or like a, <laughs> a nature or something? I just like... wrote a short film, 268 Miles, about an ultra runner which I hope to make in the next year or so. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to intertwine. I hope that one day they will, because I've certainly, I've just met so many amazing people in the film industry while I was pursuing it for the last decade or so, and I have these amazing connections with people. Uh, But I want to build something completely different now, and I hope that one day they will overlap seamlessly, and maybe if we have this conversation in a decade, I can tell you exactly when that happens. Yeah. right now they feel a bit separate mm-hmm. but I'm still doing both to a certain degree mm-hmm. and so yeah hopefully like hindsight is 2020 20, it'll all make sense one day it mm-hmm. doesn't completely make sense right now mm-hmm. but yeah I, I got certified in yoga some time like maybe five ish years ago like and again, not even because I wanted to teach just because I just wanted to take my yoga to the next level. And then somebody asked me to teach a class, and I was like, okay. And I was mostly just teaching actors in the beginning. And then yeah. somebody was like, oh, do you want to teach baby in the yoga class? And I was like, yeah. So I was always just kind of going with the flow. And whenever somebody asks me to do something, I say yes. And, and then it just creates other things. Yeah. I'll put up to And again, like, I think, too, like, that's because, like, I always had this, um, you know, kind of perception if I said like yes it would seem like I needed it or you know like I lived within like a real like kind of more like ego-based environment where like it was hard for me to like accept help or like opportunities or anything that come but it like I feel saying yes to everything I'm you know I'll put the disclaimer within reason or whatever but like it just there is so much life just in simply saying yes you know and allowing those opportunities to come because you just never know like where that amalgamation is going to come between like your film and like your your passion in your life now and like what and I think the means, one right? sort of constant with both like when I was really trying to make movies like what I was really trying to do is I wanted to like touch people right because I wanted to like motivate them to like change in some capacity right mm-hmm. and so 
that's the same when I'm working with food or movement. I want to inspire you enough to, you know, make a change so you can heal in some way. And so whether I'm trying to do that through words and kind of like art, or whether I'm trying to do that with food, the thing I'm trying to accomplish is still the same thing. It's yeah. just a very different modality. Mm-hmm. Do you see like a like a lot um, a lot more or a faster progression of cultural shift now into people wanting to seek out like health and wellness and like what that means and yeah. kind of getting back into more like like primal connections, you know, like getting back into nature, like you said, like these um, like outdoor schools, you know, like wanting and understanding the value of food and like what food and like the role it it plays in our lives. Because, you know, like you like you said, where like I feel when when you don't value food, there's like you are not going to sleep as well. Like you're not going to like hydrate as much. Like you're like you're not going to have like these emotional, you know, like balancing um or you're not gonna be as emotionally balanced. Like, like I feel like like food does play that big of a role, and the only way reason why it plays that big of a role is because we've just allowed ourselves to be able to drift so far off from yeah. like what food actually is. I know people don't eat food. That's the thing. Yeah. I <laughs> people struggle so hard. Like when I get new clients, I ask them to do like a food diary for a week, and it's like the most impossible thing. They're so disconnected from what they're eating, and then even when I do look at it, it's like mostly just food like substances it's not actual food, yeah. which is its own story but i think yeah people cancer rates are so high heart disease is so high diabetes is so high like they have to look at food not mm-hmm. because they want to but i think because they're forced to and i hope um that and I've always been so anti-Western medicine just because of the experiences I had with my dad when he was yeah. ill. But that that medicine sort of comes on board with that. Because I know sometimes it's hard to take food advice from, like, I'm a holistic nutritionist, so I'm like, oh, what does that mean? Versus somebody who has a PhD. So I hope that, because doctors don't believe that food has an impact, mm-hmm. which is crazy yeah like it just has a huge impact just even going from like vegetarian to vegan Mm -hmm. has made a huge impact on my health and then going from like vegan kind of like a junk food vegan to going like a whole food kind of vegan is like also a whole another level and like you feel it intrinsically and for doctors to say like oh it doesn't matter just take your medicine it's like ridiculous and i think that in order for there to be an even bigger shift I think Western medicine needs to um, really embrace food as well. Yeah, and like I, because this is something that like I rant with people about all the time on these podcasts and in life that I I have a lot of friends who have like, you know, like immigrated to Canada and like I was talking to like one of my really good friends who's from Sri Lanka and he said like when you go to like a good hospital like in Sri Lanka, you get two doctors. Like one of them is a Western doctor, one of them is an Eastern doctor. And they kind of triage it to say, okay, like, who's going to take over? And the other one just willfully kind of, like, exits the room. It's like, okay, your bones, bones broken. Okay, we're going to use this, like, you know, yeah. this Western m- methodology. Okay, well, it has a little bit of, like, you know, arthritis. Okay, we're going to use this, like, you know, Eastern, like, methodology. Like, right, there's 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 a lot more of, like, a, a cohesive blend of people working together. And I think, like, if we're going to make any significant change, it's allowing doctors to not suffer an ego blow and saying, okay, well, yes, you are amazing at some things, but nutrition, we all know is not one of them because you just don't learn about it in school. Yeah, and if I'm, like, in an accident, like, if I need, like, (laughs) immediate help, emergency, yeah, I want a Western doctor. That's not what I'm saying. But they just don't treat the causes, and oftentimes the cause is food. Yeah. It just is, like, 80% of the time. And I specifically, I, I recently had some ultrasounds done, um, just saw like my ovaries. And uh, about three years ago, right before I shifted from vegetarian to vegan, I was, they were like, oh, this is endometriosis, this is PCOP. Like they were trying to figure out what it was. And I had some ultrasounds where there were some cysts and some fibroids and whatnot. And I just shifted, I just cut out dairy and eggs, which was really the only thing for me. And um, recently, I'm ultrasound like three years later, and I don't have cysts or fibroids. They're just oh. gone. 
and like, oh, what's the change? Well, there's no change other than like yeah. dairy in it. And yeah. a doctor can't acknowledge yeah. that, though. They're like, oh, they just miraculously disappear. Yeah. Mm, See, they? And, <laughs> and, it is, and it is those things, right, like where we look at it and say, okay, well, we can't keep saying that, oh, you're just that one person. Because there's too many people logging those things now. Like, there's, like your story is not uncommon anymore. It was 10 years ago because there wasn't everybody logging everything. But now there's so many people telling those same stories. It's like, and it happens quickly. Like I just happened to have those scans like three years apart because like, there was no need for me to have any scans in between because yeah. my symptoms just went away. Um, but you can see a huge shift in a month or two. Yeah. Yeah, and like for me, like, and I always wonder this myself because I actually have no real data except for just how I've kind of always lived my life. Um, I was born with glomerulonephritis. It's a kidney disease. That's something that you will never grow out of. Like it's not curable. Like it's just, it's something that you have and you manage it. And by the time that I was, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, I went for one of my yearly ultrasounds and the, the tech I've ever seen there with my mom and he's just like, well, he's like, I actually think we got this form wrong. And my mom's like, why didn't you? They said, well, we're supposed to be checking for glomerulonephritis. And she's just like, yeah, my son had it since he was born. Like, as obviously as you know like it's not it's something he's gonna live with his whole life and uh he's like there's no evidence on this mm-hmm. ultrasound that he has glomerulonephritis like at all he's like if unless you told me it's just like there you can't tell and like i don't i've never got treatment i've never gone back like that was the, like the yeah. last one was i was just like okay well there's obviously something in the way that i live my life you know i've always been like you know very connected with earth like you know I've, you know my dad's always taking me camping and like hunting and fishing and you know we spend weeks and weeks in the back country and all that kind of stuff like it's just and I've always been outside I grew up on a farm in southern Alberta like you know we grew food we had chickens we had gardens like like all my you know uh, my grandma's brothers they all had different farms like one raised cows and one had wheat and barley and one had this like they all work together and it's like that's been my life and there's like, I can't, knowing what I know now, I can't argue that that hasn't played a contributing role into this whole, you know, like, experience because I hear stories like yours. Yeah. You know, and where, like, the flip side of that is somebody's like, it's not the McDonald's. Trust me. <laughs> it's not the McDonald's that's making me unhealthy. It's just, this is par for the course. And I'm like, it actually isn't. You know, we it all know that. It blows now, right? my mind that people still believe that with, like, you know, Game changers, forks over knives. I mean, the list is just like so long. There's mm-hmm. so much information. Um, I think there was this thing on the news just like a couple of weeks ago about some guy who left like a McDonald's burger in his pocket. Did you see that? And it was like a yeah. decade later and he pulled it out and it hadn't like, it hadn't composted. Yeah. There's a <laughs> it's there's just two. like, it was so scary. I'm like, how has yeah. that not composted? Like, you shouldn't eat something that isn't alive, right? right. Like, it, it needs to, it needs to be able to self-compost. And it yeah. was still like, it looked like an intact burger. It yeah. was like, mind-blowing. There's two university professors in the States. Um, and you can actually go online and like research this because it's theirs. So, um, I can't remember how it started, but it was a joke for some reason. Like one of them left a McDonald's burger on one's desk for some joke and then he went and did it to the other person and then they just kind of like left it there. And it was like 10, 15 years later because it came this running thing. Like yeah. when are these things going to like rot or get mold? And all that really happened, you can see is like the pickles kind of shriveled up a yeah. little bit. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, the yeah, buns yeah. don't have mold yeah. on them. Like the burger's not rotting. Like they don't smell. They don't stink or like I'm anything. Weird. That's not food. And it, yeah, and exactly. Yeah. But a lot of people think like this is just a quick, easy alternative. There's nothing wrong with this food. And it's just like, well, our bodies are not meant to even understand what that even remotely means. I think it's because <coughs> when we first have it. it The body has a lot of, like, ability to detoxify our liver, our kidneys, our limbs. Like, we are able to handle a toxic load for so long because we're built so well. But once we, like, hit the tipping point of that, everything sort of deteriorates so quickly. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have that negative impact, maybe the first time we have it or maybe for years when we have it we don't psychologically have the link that the two of them are connected yeah but if you get off it for like a couple weeks you you will feel the difference 
Well, and that's the thing right. to me. Like, I haven't eaten a fast food burger in probably 15 years. Like, and mm-hmm. I mean, like, joking around with, like, people when they talk about things like Tylenol. Like, it's, it's yeah, I had never... to have been over, like, 10, 15 years since I've had a Tylenol, too. And I remember the last time I had a Tylenol was probably, like, five years before that. I went in. Just one regular Tylenol, like, it just laid me out. Like, I was amazed what it did to my body. I'm like, there's just... Yeah, There's other no people way. like pop it like candy, right? Like I know people who take Advil like for preventative reasons, like every day, just because they they have they might get this little ache and pain and like all that kind of stuff, and it's just a part of their daily ritual. I think that's part where I'm so grateful for sort of my upbringing and sort of the Seventh Day Adventist and like sort of my grandmother. She was like such a minimalist in everything, where and kind of a Puritan, yeah. <laughs> but that that I have that so ingrained in me, and I've always been very skeptical of everything, and um, I think you can take that obviously too far too, but um, that was my rock and face. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a little too far. Um, maybe not. Maybe I'll revisit I want to know, no, no. tell me about it. What, why do you even categorize it as maybe that was a little bit too far? How did the wheels come off the bus? And no, no, I know. I was just never able to like do it really yeah. properly. Um, but I don't think it's the right for me living in Canada. Like, look outside; it's just not the right diet. Yeah. Like, I need hot things because I just need to warm my body. Yeah, and that doesn't mean I need processed things, right? It's just different for me. That was just a step too far. If I was living somewhere tropical. Totally. Yeah. I could do that all day long, but um, not. And I can do that in the summer. I can do that, you know, mostly whole like rock roof. But in this climate, I need warm for sure. And you know, but this sort of, I just meant this like desire for perfection, purity, like that can just sometimes go too far. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like, I always kind of like look at it as that. Things only go too far in comparison to other things that are different. Yeah. But like when we, so like, and again, you kind of like sting, I guess, like in the lane of like, like Eastern medicine and Eastern modalities where like I say to people, you know, all these methodologies and all these like concepts and philosophies were all adopted at a point in time where like, it was really easy to be able to get there. And I feel like some of our most enlightened people now based in these systems are kind of like where most people just started off when they were born mm. before because everybody kind of thought the same way. Everybody lived very close to the land. You know, like there are small communities. Like it was very, a lot more like tranquil. Things might have been a lot harder, but again, like, you know, people working together. Like it was just, it was easier to get there. There was no like, okay, well, you know, I have to fight this car thing. How big is my TV? Like yeah. my Facebook, like all these kind of things to, and you got to weed through all of that mess to try to get to a point where you can find this wholeness so like when you're doing those things and people say well i've taken this too far and it's just like well wouldn't too far technically be how all of these philosophies were created because that's like the farthest you can go yeah. you know so it's i always kind of find it like interesting in that topic of conversation like what what is too far like when because like we all have been there we're like okay i think i went a little crazy with this no, but I like extreme experiences. Like, yeah. I thrive on extreme experiences. And I think in isolation, they're super awesome. I just don't know if it's like, oh, could I be a rock Buddhist forever? Yeah. Probably not. But I can go do that for three months. And I have done a 21-day water fast and the 10-day silent meditation. And mm-hmm. I've done, like, all these things because wow. I like... Yeah. I, I, I like experiencing different things in my body and I'm curious. I mean, I think yeah. part of it is just like, oh, I'm going to try this challenge. And people are like, you don't know the challenge? But like, yeah, because I want to know. Like, I'm just curious. And I'm curious of like the experience inside yeah. of my own body, just like I used to like feeling a lot of feelings when I was an actor. So I think in isolation, all the extremes are awesome. I just don't think I want to, for the sake of my adrenals, live in an extreme state all the time yeah i just want the extreme states to be isolated with some yeah some mellowness in between <laughs> absolutely what was the 21 day water fast like is it the first like three four days is the hardest right and then it kind of gets a little bit easier after that first certain point in time and then... i mean i did it in panama at like a retreat this was after how do i i don't know if i had finished canadian school of natural nutrition but it was some I think so, somewhere around that time. And I did, I really wanted to be a natural practitioner 
right around that time. So I signed up for this internship in Panama at this place, and you had to do a 21-day water fast, and then you would refeed for a week, and then you would help other people go through these fasting periods for three months. No, I didn't have a great time and ended up leaving after a yeah. month. Uh, but I, the, the fasting experience was awesome. I really enjoyed it. I think the first, I don't, I don't remember if the first three or four days were the hardest. I don't like yeah, really yeah. remember that because I was like 25 when I did it. I'm like 38 now. It's just like a lot of years yeah. to like think back. But I remember having really vivid dreams. Like my dreams were super crazy and super connected and I don't have a lot of dreams about my brother ever but I had very very vivid dreams um, both with my father and my brother actually during that time so it felt like spiritual like in those mm-hmm. conversations felt super real like I knew there were dreams but they're not the kind of dreams I've ever had before or after and I know that the fasting played like a huge part in having them so that is the thing that stands out the most to me about those experiences yeah and also like you feel really clean yeah like yeah it's like yeah it's a nice feeling awesome that's cool do you have any other experiences kind of like on the books is there anything that you're going to be trying anytime soon no (laughs) No? not right now um i'm really just trying to be more mellow in my life right now um, and doing things daily rather than like the big experiences, which I used yeah. to psych myself out for. But it's really like the daily, like getting outside and moving. That's like really important to me. And I know that that will accumulate to like some like big adventure in the summer, I'm sure. But I don't yeah. know what that is exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm going to run my first ultra this summer. Sweet. Yeah, I've done like yeah. a couple um, marathons. But yeah, I want to really be out there and mm-hmm. find something that I haven't picked yet. You should do a leg of the PCT with me um, for my 40th birthday. My birthday sure. is in the summertime, so. But yeah, um, that's like four years away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're like three and a half years away from it and stuff, but it's, I'm uh, down. yeah, I'm, it's going to be, uh, I'm like super pumped to do it because I ran the West Coast Trail for 30 and then it'll be PCT for 40 and then I just want to do like. Everest at 50, and then I want to complete the World Ultra Marathon Series at 60. So What's there's... the World Ultra Marathon Series? So there's um, there's four ultras that you run, and you have three years to do it. And, uh, like, they're marked, but they're not sanctioned, so it's self-regulated. Okay. Um, but there's one um, in Colorado, so you go through the Rockies. Um, there's one in the Sahara Desert. Um, there's one in Siberia. And then there's one in the Amazon rainforest. Amazing. Yeah, and like you just said, so it's all the like harshest climates, you know. Like yeah, you know. it reminds me of the Four Desert series, mm-hmm. which is also really cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, why don't you drop some uh, social media handles and some website info and all that kind of stuff so people can get in contact with you and we'll wrap this sucker up. Sure. Um, you can find me. I'm like, oh, where are all my things? At Orsi on Twitter at yoga by orsi on instagram and it's orsizabo.com and so all the things o-r-s-y s-z-a-b-o Yo. awesome well thank you so much thank you